You're listening to the Oddities Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about four serial killers. I got at least four in Bellingham. Three of them visited the Waterfront Tavern, which is down on Holly Street. I'll have to post a pic of that. Um, Ted Bundy, Kenneth, is it Bianchi? Is that how you say his name? And John Allen Muhammad, the DC sniper. And then the other uh, serial killer is James Allen Kinney who um, we'll get to in a minute here. So we have some quotes from people that actually were at the waterfront, either as bartenders or servers or whatever. And the one I have here is for Muhammad. He said he would come in a few times a week, a couple of years back, always around 9 a.m., lugging around a huge army duffel bag. He'd order a pint of Budweiser and watch ESPN and The Price is Right. (laughs) He was polite, but he wasn't very sociable, says bartender Wally Owen, I think is how you say his name. He'd answer a question, but he was never very outgoing. Um, he said that he once applied for a job as a cook, but they weren't hiring. He stopped coming a few weeks later and he said most people just forgot about him until they saw him on television. So um, for you, those of you who don't know the DC sniper story, he befriended a young boy who was right. 17, I think, at yep. the time. What was the boy's name? Lee. Oh, gosh. What was it? Lee Malvo. And he was from Jamaica. Yep. And what was the thing he um he kind of brainwashed him or what was he telling him? Do well, you remember? initially when he first let met leave out Malvo, it was uh-huh. um his mother that he had met and she was trying to get to the US and he was in the Caribbean with his children mm-hmm. forging illegal documents. Okay. And so his initial acquaintance with Lee Malvo was trying to get him and his mother uh-huh. over to the US and um, Lee Malvo Lee Malvo had a really hard upbringing. He was lacking a father figure and pretty resentful from a young age. Mm-hmm. And so um, at the time, uh, Muhammad was kind of more of a, mo- a father figure to Lee Malvo. Okay. Yeah, and Muhammad was, he he was a vet, right? Right. He was a vet. Yeah. Actually, he was at uh, Fort Lewis okay. in Washington, down over by like Lakewood and DuPont off I-5. Yeah, and he had converted to islam right right he and, changed his name yeah and he support he was he supported the 9-11 attacks right. i remember reading something i don't know if i have it in here but i was reading that on the day it happened he celebrated and like the people in the bar wanted to beat the shit out of him <laughs> but <Yeah>. refrained <laughs> um so here's a little summary on the dc sniper um john allen muhammad along with his 17 year old partner lee boyd malvo carried out the 2002 dc sniper attacks killing 10 people and wounding several others in the washington area that's washington dc right yeah most of the shootings were made with a high-powered rifle from inside the truck of muhammad's vehicle which had been modified with heavy window tent a hinged rear seat that provided easy access to the trunk from the passenger compartment and a hole that had been cut into the trunk lid just above the license plate so this was like 19 years ago. I right. still remember when this was happening on the news yeah. when they were trying to find him. It's pretty fucking crazy. They were looking at um, people who had been in the military, which he had, right, right. to try to track him down. And I think one of the clues I remember at the time is he had been practicing on some shooting range. Out here. Yeah. Yeah, he was training Lee Malvo. Apparently, Lee yeah. Malvo was enrolled at Bellingham High School. And every day after school, um, Muhammad would take him out and they would go to a local shooting range and uh-huh. they'd practice his marksmanship. Who should we hit next? Should we hit Ted Bundy? Yeah, and we could circle back Bundy. to this. Okay, so Ted Bundy, for those of you who don't know, American serial killer who kidnapped, raped, and murdered numerous young women and girls during the 1970s and possibly earlier. After more than a decade of denials, he confessed to 30 homicides committed in seven states between 1974 and 1978. His true victim total is unknown and and believed by some investigators to be higher. Bundy was regarded as handsome and charismatic, traits that he exploited to win the trust of victims and society. He would typically approach his victims in public places, feigning injury or disability or impersonating an authority figure before knocking them unconscious and taking them to secluded locations to rape and strangle them. He sometimes revisited his victims, grooming and performing sexual acts with the decomposing corpses until putrefaction and destruction by wild animals made any further interactions impossible. He decapitated at least 12 victims and kept some of the severed heads as mementos in his apartment. On a few occasions, he broke into dwellings at night and bludgeoned his victims as they slept. Crazy. And his victim profile, like the people that he would seek out, were 
you know, women that were uh-huh. about college age and ones that he could prey on and use their, you know, helping yeah. nature to kind of convince them. His whole like shtick of feigning injury to get right. people to help him. That was kind of like in uh, Silence of the Lambs oh, with gosh. Buffalo Bill. Did you see Silence of the Lambs? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't seen it, there's um, a serial killer on the loose and he kind of did the same thing Ted Bundy did where... He'd act like his arm was in a cast and he'd try to get some young girl to help him like load a couch into a van. And when she was backed into the van, he would just shut the door and drive off with her. So that's pretty much what Bundy did. So if you've seen Silence of the Lambs, Buffalo Bill, I think, was the... The guy in some yep. in Silence of the Lambs. Well, yeah. and the weird thing is Ted Bundy even had like his car set up to handcuff people. Like in the passenger seat, he had like handcuffs that were attached to the bottom of the seat that he could then handcuff them in the car uh-huh. in the front seat. What's really cool too, or not cool, but interesting is that um, <laughs> he was friends with a woman named Anne Rule. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> the um, author. <laughs> yeah. She was writing a book about the killings that were going on at this time. Mm-hmm. Um and she actually knew Ted Bundy. So why she was writing this book about the killings that Bundy was doing, she was friends with Bundy, obviously not knowing he was the one that was doing all the killings. I have here, um, they answered phones together at Seattle Suicide Hotline. And she says, this is a quote from Ann Rule. And if anybody had told me that I'd been locked up all night alone with possibly the most dangerous man to women in America, I would have thought you were crazy. She felt safe with him and he would walk me to my car when my shift was over and he would say, Anne, be sure your doors are locked. I don't want anything bad to happen to you on the way home. Even after the crisis hotline work, they stayed friends. Then women started disappearing. In an odd twist, Rule had a book deal to write about the murders, not knowing her friend was committing them. But eventually she started to see similarities and called police. Isn't that nuts? That's going to make your skin crawl looking back and realizing that the person that worked at a suicide hotline with you was... Yeah, and he was also part of... I don't know if I printed this out, but I was reading. He was part of, like, I don't know if it was the Democratic or Republican Party. Like, different... Right. Yeah, he was big into politics and yep. all kinds of stuff. He was and even... He studied a bit of law, from what I understand. For a while, he was trying yeah. to represent himself when the court proceedings were happening. He was... um. He was enrolled at UW as a psych major, became an honor student, was well regarded by his professors. Mm -hmm. In 1971, he took a job at Seattle Suicide Hotline Crisis Center, and that's where he met and worked with Ann Rule, a former Seattle police officer and aspiring crime writer who would later write one of the definitive Bundy biographies, The Stranger Beside Me. Rule saw nothing disturbing in Bundy's personality at the time and described him as kind, solicitous, and empathetic. What is salicious? I don't know that word, but that's a big word, and that's what we're going with. It's an author word. Um, <laughs> yeah. What else did you find on Bundy? Pretty much that he would travel up and down I-5, uh-huh. you know, kind of just opportunistically preying on women. And while he was at UW, you know, it's presumed that he probably traveled up I-5. And one of the things that I found about the Waterfront Tavern in specific was that People were speculating that the reason it drew all the serial killers there was because of its proximity in the U.S. Like the farthest corner you can get, Uh kind of the sleepiest little town right on the water. You you know, you're almost out of the U.S. The border's right there. Maybe, you know, that's the draw for these people. And so I would assume that the same was true for Bundy, you know, just a quiet, sleepy town, probably, Mm -hmm. you know. Now, I haven't listened to... um what is it called the Ted Bundy tapes Ted Bundy on tapes is on Netflix, Netflix right? Yep. How is that? It is good. Um, what are the tapes like? Him being interviewed by police when he was right. arrested. Yep. Uh-huh. A lot of interview tapes, and they uh, chose Zac Efron as the oh, yeah. actor. So and what's know, what's the vibe it. like? Is it like? Because um, I watched this thing on um, I think it was Netflix where Piers Morgan interviewed serial killers that right. were caught in behind bars, and universally, almost all of them deny it in some strange way like it wasn't me i didn't do it they got the wrong guy i was framed but you could tell in their demeanor that they're off right right but in the ted bundy tapes is does he admit to any of it or is he denying it like what's the he denies it but you can tell that like the way that he's crafting his story it's Uh it's akin to like duper's delight he's getting off on the fact that he's able to Mm -hmm. string these you know, investigators along and kind of direct them in the way that he wants them to be directed. Yeah. And he thinks that he's going to get away with it. Yeah. I mean, he has for so long and who no one even really knows what his body count is now. 
even after the fact. And I think that even though he confessed to all of those crimes, once the evidence mounted to a point where he couldn't deny it, mm -hmm. I think that he still retains satisfaction of knowing that like he's the only true person who knows how many people he killed and yeah. who all he killed. Yeah. And he went to the grave with that. You know, they, they executed him in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that even to the very bitter end, when you, you know, listen to these tapes, you can tell in the tone of his voice that like, Towards the end, he's accepting reality, yeah. you know, that he's been caught. But he still has these little things that make him feel grandiose. Yeah. You know, he's still got that narcissism where he's like, you know, well, I still took these lives and you'll never know how many. Mm -hmm. And you, maybe you'll never even did, find all the bodies. And did he say why in the tapes he did it or what was the compulsion to do it? Not specifically, but, mm -hmm. you know, he loved talking about himself and uh -huh. gave a lot away and in that respect where, you know, it was just all about power. And yeah. that's a common theme in a lot of these serial killers that freak it in the waterfront tavern. They mm -hmm. wanted control. They like to manipulate. And, and a lot of them just had these urges from early on, you know, that yeah. didn't come to fruition until later. So w with Ted Bundy, um, it was reported that he did visit the waterfront tavern, mm -hmm. but the, the women that he killed was at what? Lake Samish? Lake Sammamish. Sammamish. Right. And it was two, right? Yep. And was there any other people from around or close to the Bellingham area? That Not supposedly... that we know of. Uh -huh. There are some people that have been missing from around that time, but again... No, nothing confirmed other than those two women. So here's here's a couple um, little snippets about some of his victims. So this is Ted Bundy again. Shortly after midnight on January 4th, 1974, Bundy entered the basement apartment of 18-year-old Karen Sparks. Identified as Joni Lentz, Mary Adams, and Terry Caldwell by various sources. A dancer and student at UW. After bludgeoning Sparks senseless with a metal rod from her bed frame... He sexually assaulted her with either the same rod or a metal speculum, causing extensive internal injuries. She remained unconscious for 10 days, but survived with permanent physical and mental disabilities. In the early morning hours of February 1st, Bunny broke into the basement room of Linda Ann Healy, a UW undergraduate who broadcast morning radio weather reports for skiers. He beat her unconscious, dressed her in blue jeans, a white blouse and boots, and carried her away, which is crazy. Right. Um... During the first half of 1974, female college students disappeared at a rate of about one per month. On March 12th, Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, left her dormitory to attend a jazz concert on campus but never arrived. On April 17th, Susan Elaine Rancourt disappeared while on her way to her dorm room after an evening advisors meeting at Central Washington State College in Ellensburg. Two female Central Washington students later came forward to report encounters, one on the night of Rancourt's disappearance, the other three nights earlier, with a man wearing an arm sling, asking for help carrying a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. On May 6, Roberta Kathleen Parks left her dormitory at Oregon State University in Corvallis to have coffee with friends at the Memorial Union, but never arrived. Detectives from King County and Seattle Police Departments grew increasingly concerned. There was no significant physical evidence, and the missing women had little in common apart from being young, attractive, white college students with long hair parted in the middle. Right. On June 1st, Brenda Carroll Ball, 22, disappeared after leaving the Flame Tavern in Burien near Seattle Tacoma International Airport. She was last seen in the parking lot talking to a brown-haired man with his arm in a sling. Oh, here's a little bit more on that. One woman recalled that the man asked her to help him carry the case to his car, a light Volkswagen, light tan Volkswagen Beetle. Bundy later told Capel that he lured Hawkins to his car before rendering her unconscious with a crowbar. He then handcuffed Hawkins and drove her to Issaquah, a suburb 20 miles east of Seattle, where he strangled her and spent the entire night with her body. Bundy said that Hawkins regained consciousness inside the car and said she had a Spanish test the following day and she thought I had taken her to help tutor her for the Spanish test. It's not funny, he added, but it's odd the thing, the kind of things people will say under those circumstances. He stated that he returned to the UW alley the morning after Hawkins' abduction and murder. There, in the very midst of a major crime scene investigation, he located and gathered Hawkins' earrings and one of her shoes where he had left them in the adjoining parking lot and departed unobserved. He admitted to re revisiting Hawkins' corpse on three occasions. <laughs> it's so, so disgusting. It's so insane that these people exist. So one interesting fact about Ted Bundy that I learned growing up was uh -huh. that my mother was kind of growing up around this time and uh -huh. everyone was afraid 
you know, which is yeah. kind of a universal thing that women were going missing. Where did and, your mom growing up? Where um, was she? So like the Kitsap County area. Okay. So, you know, Washington, uh -huh. lifelong resident. And she recalled that her mom at one point forced her to change her part because she had a middle part. Oh, no and shit. Long hair. Wow. Yep. And so just kind That's of out of the blue, she said, you know, you need to, we need to change your part to the middle part. So that way, you know, you uh -huh. can stay safe. My mom didn't understand it at, you know, at the time, but as she got older, she kind of put two and two together. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, it was probably because of Bundy. It's probably a good move, man. Right. I wonder if that's <laughs> how he like stalked it. Like he has a certain type or certain yeah, look. There was speculation for. that it was like, you know, a strained relationship with his mother and that he was seeking out women that were. Uh, I was going to ask you about that. Did you read anything about his childhood? Like it was he abused or. He was pretty tight lipped about a lot of his family uh -huh. past stuff, even with, you know, friends prior to being found out as a serial killer he's uh -huh. you know pretty private about his past life so you know that's why it's all speculation and and he definitely had a hatred towards women and something you know it's so crazy and i think that. we looked it up one time there's how many active killers in the united oh, serial killers well by the way to be <laughs> to be classified as serial killer you have to kill three or more people three right. that's what okay. how they classify a serial killer let me look this up again really quick because i'm curious it's I know a disturbingly it, high number of people. How many <laughs> active serial killers in the U.S.? According to the FBI, the number of serial killers that are still not caught among the USA varies from 25 to 50. So mm -hmm. almost one per state. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, and you know a lot of them are concentrated in the Pacific Northwest. It seems to be opportunistically good. There's lots of woods to hide bodies. Yeah. Plus the lack of vitamin D. The top state for serial killers was Texas. Really? Yep. Okay. I saw a printout. And then California, I think, was two. And Washington was number three. Okay. We're number three or four. I'm not surprised. In terms of that. serial killers. Um, I just saw this. The smiley face killer murdered over 45 students by drowning. Oh, yeah. That's a whole do you know? Theory. Do you know who that is? No. I don't know. See, personally, I don't know if I buy the whole serial killer smiley face thing. Uh -huh. They're finding a lot of, like, male students that had party the night before drowned in bodies of I water. I think you told me about this a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah. Because there was up? one that was uh -huh. in Bellingham. And you know, he oh, had I remember died that one. shortly before I was slated to come to Western. Yeah. And um, some people had said that they found like a graffiti smiley face spray painted nearby. But he was found in an industrial that area. That could have been so randomly anywhere. Yeah. Right. And that's the kind of connection that's being drawn here is that all these, you know, college age dudes who are out partying and then they turn up dead near a body of water and there's yeah. like a smiley face spray painted nearby. But I think that that might just be a bit coincidence. of coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's all fun and games when you're drunk and there's a body of water nearby. And, <laughs> uh -huh. You know, maybe you forget how to swim or maybe yeah. you get hypothermia or, you know, there's a lot of That's possibilities. That's interesting. They it could be connected, but. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not current on like any active serial killers that are, do you know of like, you usually don't find Supposedly, out. Supposedly there's one in like Joshua Tree National Park right now. Oh, really? Why That's they, what I've they've heard. been finding some dead bodies? Well, there's just been a lot of people going missing and then they'll find their bodies later, but I mean at I this you know point, I'm it's not sure funny they... because I um I would always think, you know, in this day and age with DNA testing, oh, yeah. cell phones, GPS tracking, everywhere. everyone like a lot of people have the ring doorbells mm -hmm. on their houses. But so I bring this up because in the documentary The Night Stalker on Netflix, right. one of the detectives was Gil something yeah i don't i forget his last name <laughs> but um i was listening to him on a podcast a few weeks ago and one of the people on the podcast asked him he goes you know richard ramirez like no no one could do that nowadays right yeah. they couldn't and he's like sure they could yeah like sure they could like i was like oh it's interesting because I, right. I would think with all this tech like the street cameras are going to pick you up someone's house camera is going right. to pick you up well, and with dna testing you're solving plate. cases that are over 20 yeah. years old and still convicting people so i used to think i would think you know hundreds of years ago when like can you imagine the amount of unsolved murders hundreds of years ago like in the united states like when there is no internet no cell phone no dna technology like nothing there's no community there's like communication by horseback <laughs> you can literally be kidding. on a horse yeah. traveling to another state and just randomly meet murder people yep and no one would ever know like right. you could shoot him or stab him and just keep on trucking along on your horse yeah. no one's gonna know you did it like what evidence is there there's nothing right you're out in the middle of nowhere like murder back in the day must have been the easiest fucking thing to get well, away it with. makes you wonder how many are still like <laughs> unsolved or even unfound uh -huh. you know they didn't have a national I, yeah. database for missing people so even if they did find a body 
you yeah. know it's just word of mouth on who the body might be in the nearby area yeah i remember have you seen the movie there will be blood i haven't oh you gotta watch it it's one of the best movies okay. ever i won't say anything because there was a, a, a murder <laughs> no scene in there i was going to comment on but <laughs> even in like modern day they're like i saw this i think it was mexico what do you think the amount of murders are that are solved in mexico mm. I'll say Probably what pretty low. What percentage of murders in Mexico aren't solved? It was some some crazy number. Let's see here. Okay. What percentage do you think? So Washington Post, this is an article from November eighth, twenty nineteen. Okay. What percentage of violent crimes including homicides go unsolved in mexico would you say what percentage i guess maybe like 40. dustin what do you got what percentage you think go unsolved in mexico in mexico yep yeah 98 percent. whoa <laughs> almost all of them i was gonna say there's so no way you like guess if that. you need to murder someone i mean there's this other article here it says 95 percent go unpunished um it says, solving a murder in Mexico is the exception, not the rule. It would take 124 years to solve all the murder cases. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. So be careful when you go vacationing, I guess. <laughs> Oof. Here's another one from 2013. 98% of murders in Mexico last year went unsolved. Now fucking nuts, dude. Right. It's like, can you imagine, like do they not investigate these murders like so many of them must have just be like cartel i was gonna gang, say there's probably a lot just, of like corruption involved dude in i couldn't even imagine i wonder system. i wonder what it is in the u.s what do you guys think it is in the u.s i would hope of murders <laughs> like yeah i i would hope it'd be like less than 25 percent okay let's see here there's near okay so this is an article on vox.com september 24th 2018 there's a nearly 40 percent chance you'll get away with murder in america it says this is nothing new the murder clearance rate has generally hovered around 60 percent for years it's 40 percent dude this, okay here's an article yeah 2015 to use the fbi's terminology the national clearance rate for homicide today is 64.1 percent mm. That's not as high as I was hoping it would be. <laughs> Which is 62... Per okay, here's an article. Most U.S. crimes go unsolved and many victims don't contact police. So this is from June 18th, 2020. Just 62% of murders and 33% of rapes are solved. So almost, yeah, still 38 to 40% of murders go unsolved. That's crazy. That's really sad for the families, too, of the victims. You never get justice. The one that's haunting that still sticks in my mind. I don't know if you and I ever talked about this. Because I, I remember talking about this with someone. But... um. Do you guys remember a few years ago, there was two girls that were strangled in the woods on a trail and one of the girls happened to get an audio recording. Oh yeah, yeah, the Delphi murders, right? Is that what it is? I think so, yeah. And I've listened to recording, and it's it so like he's creepy. Saying, like, he's down like the down the hill, down the hill. Down the yeah. hill. Dude, that haunts me. I still, I looked it up recently, maybe maybe months ago, because they still haven't found the guy that had some weird sketch of it. Well, and they have like oh, recordings of the video, like actual visual photographs and still frames of the video like the delphi murders here we go yeah. um i know we're getting off track we'll get back to our <laughs> hey it's all but murder this is february 14th 2017 the bodies of abigail williams and liberty german were discovered near the monon i guess that's how you say it high bridge trail which is part of the delphi historic trails in delphi indiana united states after the young girls had disappeared from the same trail the previous day one unidentified male um the Delphi Murders audio. Let's see if I can. <laughs> so spooky. Audio. And the scary part is they captured the video of him following them while they were up on the trestle bridge. So who caught the, who, he, the girls the shot girls, the video? One of the girls did. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to put this up on the podcast. Okay. I'm, I'm going to shut up and see if you guys can hear this. Wait, let me start it over. Yeah. He's going to say down the hill. Hold on. Sounds like you're saying guys down the hill. Guys down the hill. Yeah, dude. God. And this... he's wearing like a big jacket and it's like a grainy yeah. early 2000s. I'll post a video on here video. so everyone can see, but oh my God. Can you fucking imagine just some creeper on a trail, man? Yeah. 
Didn't you tell me that someone was murdered on a trail? Yeah. When was this? Um. Well, there's been like a few, but... It was recently though, right? Um, or maybe a year or two ago? I'm not sure about any recent I think ones. It was, a lot it, of it was you who told me, right? Missing. Yeah. Yeah. But there's one locally where it's a woman that's been missing on Sock Mountain for a long time. Where's that? Um, That's... Okay, Dustin, help me out with geography. <laughs> Sock Mountain? Where's Sock Mountain? That's out by Darrington and the Mountain Loop area, right? Off of Highway 530? Yeah. Uh-huh. And essentially, it's just a big mountainous hiking trail. And she disappeared? Her name's Patty Krieger, and she disappeared while she was hiking with an, a, a whole group of people. What? Her boyfriend and some other friends and her dog, Bear. And apparently, they were going up there to spread some ashes of someone in their family who uh-huh. had died. And supposedly... She had wandered off once they got near the top, and they expected her to go down the back side of the mountain and just meet them down in the park. Why was lot. she going by herself all well, of a sudden? Well, that's the big question. Wait a second. So the yeah. group said that she decided to wander off by herself? That doesn't make yeah. any sense. With her dog. And then her dog was found like a few miles away from the mountain. Like, and they didn't find her body? Later. Nope. And they've never found her. And her boyfriend was... You know, kind of relatively new to the scene. She had lost her husband and inherited a bunch of money. So then this guy shows up on the scene. So it was her boyfriend. Who else was with the group? Um, just like a bunch of friends of the boyfriend, and you know, mutual Dude, friends with her. Shut up. Yeah, and then he inherited a bunch of her money. Oh, and he killed her, cars. of course. That's what I was thinking. How did he inherit the money though? Like the boyfriend? Why does the boyfriend get the money and not like other family? I'm not sure. Family? It might have been in the will or something. Oh, he killed her for sure. That's what I. That's what a lot of people think. I, the only other option is she fell down a fucking cliff right. somewhere, and you know. What there I mean? were some pretty extensive search and rescue efforts trying to find her right? under the presumption that she was still missing. I wonder. You know, you always wonder. She, like, like I don't know anything about you know, like dogs. Right. But like her scent's got to be pretty. Like on the trail, like you think right. the dogs could pick up her scent and find her. Right. Well, she had a dog with her that was eventually recovered in a different the dogs area. Dogs can fucking talk, man. Later. That dog knows. Yeah. That dog knows he what happened. I think so. He probably stayed with her. And oh. Then... They haven't found her body? Nope. How long ago was this? Uh, let me double check. I'd hate to get the dates wrong. It's been a while. Um... Got to do a podcast on that, I think. Yeah. I think it would be good just to get her a little exposure. Um, She was 65 years old when she vanished from the Sock Mountain Trail in 2010. Oh, this is 11 years ago. 11 years ago. Damn. Yep. And she was with uh, six other people as well as her faithful Rottweiler bear. And does it say who the six other people were? I mean, I know you said boyfriend. Let's see. But... Among the other people in the group were Patty's boyfriend, 42-year-old Larry Presley, a relative of his, Troy Robinson, Robinson's girlfriend, Nicole Gardner, and three other relatives of Larry, the boyfriend. So most of them were. It would be weird to get a whole group of people in on a murder. Like, that seems so sketch because it's like, you got to get everyone to go along with it. Right. So you have to come from a family of deviants that are super or people like. people that are just super loyal and wouldn't say anything because maybe they're getting a How cut much out money of it. Did, did he get, did it say? Um, no. And I'm not really. Sh- let's see. Larry and his friends have been living at Patty's house, and her family soon heard sightings of Larry driving around in her luxury cars. Of course. They went over to the rev- residence, but Larry wouldn't let them in. So they eventually got a court order to gain access to her home. Once inside, they found it trashed. Beer cans everywhere, her safe emptied. Of course. Naturally, suspicions turned towards Larry. Prior to meeting him, Patty had been married to a successful real estate investor, Jason Graham, who passed away in 2006. Jason was an associate of Larry's who got wind of his passing while he was serving time in prison. Uh, uh, Upon his release, he got in touch with Patty uh-huh, and said that Jack Jason had asked him to take care of her should anything ever happen. <laughs> Patty soon fell for his charm, although their happy union didn't last long. She told co-workers about his short temper and finding a gun as well as a stash of marijuana hidden behind a wall in her home. She also told friends that the pair didn't have a physical relationship because Larry was impotent. <laughs> Although it later transpired that he was sleeping with several other women and even ended up getting one pregnant. What? Yep. Less than one year after Patty vanished, Larry married Donika Mayhalard. Mm-hmm. Police came to search their house after Larry was arrested for assaulting a police officer where they found drugs and a number of stolen weapons, including one that belonged to a homicide victim. It wasn't Larry's first time in trouble with the law. He had more than 30 previous convic- convictions. Nonetheless, Gary... Larry pleaded guilty to the charge 
and was sentenced to three years in prison while Donica, his new wife, took the rap for the other charges. She was sentenced to 12. So pretty much... Oh, he killed her. Yeah, Dude, shut up. and then he moved on afterwards. That's what, kind of what it sounds like. Um, so, like, what do you do with the body, though? Like, how could they not find it in the woods? Like, where, where do you put it? Even people who just go missing, who aren't murdered, you know, uh-huh. missing hikers that step off the trail and meet a bad fate. There's <clears throat> so much underbrush here yeah. and so much wild area that it really wouldn't be that hard. And bodies, it's going to sound terrible, but after a certain point in de- decomposition, yeah. it's really, really hard to find them because yeah. all the colors and all the shapes of human yeah. bones and tissue are going to be masked by it's going to be gone yeah even if you search with drones which you know uh-huh. they do pretty regularly it's still really hard to spot these things get away with murder man <laughs> we're uh, not condoning this a hundred percent i mean it's so obvious that he they killed her probably yeah unfortunately I mean, unless there happened to randomly be some serial killer up in the mountain that day that right well, and they even claimed that they, you know, had called after her, but her hearing wasn't super good. They uh-huh. were like, where are you going? And she just ignored them and wandered off. But it doesn't make sense. That's like the dumbest story ever. Right. Oh, my God. Wow. And I guess that's the thing, man. If you can't find the body, you just, if you're like a detective. There's no way that you can convict. And yeah. even if you wow. bring convictions of other charges, you can't tack on murder without having a body. Yeah. And they want to keep that possibility open because they can always charge people later on down the line. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. I I, I always thought, you know, if you were going to, like, murder someone up in the mountains in the woods is the perfect way to do it. Because you could literally go up to, like, an an overlook Mm -hmm. and just, like, push them off. No cameras, no people. They fell. Oh, my God. They fell. (laughs) There have been a lot of those cases where it's like, oh, no, they fell. And then it turns out (laughs) later that they were pushed. Of course they were. (laughs) Oh, my God. Crazy. All right, so we also have to talk about... Well, we have two more people to talk about. Kenneth Bianchi. Yep. The Hillside Strangler. He had a lot of connections to Dude, so this guy... <laughs> let me pull this guy up here. See where I want to start. This guy was briefly mentioned in the um, the Night Stalker. Right. Because um, one of the detectives that helped find Richard Ramirez helped crack the case. Because Bianchi killed people with his cousin whose name was Angelo Buno. Is that how you say it? Bueno. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they were both... Oh, well, let me just read this little part here. Kenneth Alessio Bianchi is an American serial killer, kidnapper, and rapist. He is known for the 1977 through 79 Hillside Strangler murders committed with his cousin Angelo Buno. Bueno. Bueno. (laughs) Junior, as well as for murdering two more women in Washington by himself. Bianchi is currently serving a sentence of life imprisonment in Washington State Penitentiary for these crimes. So um, I'll let you go first. What did you find on this guy? Quite a bit. So first of all, um, he was born in Rochester, New York, and he was um, adopted Mm -hmm. a few months after birth. And although he was above average intelligence, it sounds like he really, really struggled in academics. Yeah. And he was a bit of a liar he was really manipulative and he had a really short temper so that became problematic in school he was bullied a bit and because he didn't do well in school um he struggled and eventually he wanted to become a cop yep. so after high school he tried to enroll in a community college um and take classes to work towards that um again his academics really sucked so he ended up dropping out and becoming a security guard instead but it sounds like even that he was still, you know, failing at succeeding. He was stealing from his employers and um, yeah, he would steal jewelry because he was a security guard. I forget right. where it is, whatever jewelry store, maybe just the mall. I don't know where I forget. But he would steal jewelry and give it to like prostitutes right. and like his girlfriends. And I found this interesting. Even while committing the murders, Bianchi applied for a job with the Los Angeles Police Department <laughs> and had even been taken for several rides with police officers while they were searching for the Hillside Strangler. Which ended up angering his cousin, Angelo. Yeah. And that's actually how they ended up splitting ways and why Kenneth ended up in Bellingham. On January 11th, 1979, working as a security guard, Bianchi lured two female students into a house he was guarding. The women were 22-year-old Karen Mandic Mm -hmm. and 27-year-old Diane Wilder, both students at Western Washington University. Bianchi forced Mandic down the stairs and and then strangled her. 
He murdered Wilder in a similar fashion. Without help from his partner, Bianchi left many clues and police apprehended him the next day. A California driver's license and a routine back check, background check linked him to the addresses of two stranger, strangler victims. Shortly after Bianchi committed the 11th and 12th murders, he revealed to Bion... How you say Bueno. Bueno. <laughs> that he'd gone on LAPD police ride-alongs and that he was currently being questioned about the Strangler case. Bueno flew into a rage and threatened to kill Bianchi if he did not move to Bellingham, Washington, mm -hmm. which he did in May 1978. Right. Um, and while he was here, he was actually living with his girlfriend who had moved home to be with her parents because she was pregnant with their kid. So while he's doing all of this, he's got a family uh -huh. and a son of his own that live in Bellingham with him. I'm trying to find the part from the, I want to find the part from the Waterfront Tavern. I think I had oh. a a quote from one of the bartenders or people that worked yeah. there. What so Jim Runquist, a 40 year old regular at the tavern said Bianchi was an odd fellow. Quote, he just looked weird. He had kinky hair and his eyes mm -hmm. looked like he would just staring at nowhere. Um, another thing that was kind of interesting about Bianchi's case is that Later on, after his conviction, there was a woman, I think her name was Veronica? Yeah. And apparently she was just infatuated with him mm -hmm. and hellbent on trying to get his conviction overturned. Oh, I do remember some so of this. Yeah, I did read some of this. She would try to convince them that they hadn't caught him. And then she tried to kill someone. So, okay, yeah. I'll let you go. You I, go. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say, the really, let me see if I can find it. There's a really interesting aspect about that. Okay, Veronica, a woman who was determined to help undermine the trial of Bianchi. She attempted to copycat killing to sow doubt that Kenneth was the true killer. Because he was already arrested in police custody. He was custody. already in yeah. jail, right, yeah. and they were communicating. So, she traveled to Bellingham and from California and befriended a woman at a tavern. Mm-hmm. A parks and recreation woman uh -huh. that she befriended at a tavern. What would the odds be? It was waterfront. <laughs> um, she invited her back to her motel to uh -huh. partake in drugs uh -huh. and attempted to strangle her, but ultimately failed. Dude, I mean, that's your that's wifey material right there. <laughs> that's your ride or die. Your girl's willing to murder. End up at different jails, though. <laughs> that's a fucking crazy thing, too, because right. we all kind of know like certain women who have mental issues <laughs> get fascinated with serial killers right. and like want to mar marry them in prison. Oh, that happened with the Ted Bundy trial, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, because there was a judge present. So during his trial, his girlfriend at the time who had been writing to him uh -huh. was present and he stood up and declared them married Yeah, because it was in front of a judge. That's so and it was crazy. during the trial. And I mean, I guess technically, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they're married. So Bianchi um, and his cousin. So there, I want to read a little bit more about him. Here's going back to what you just said. I'll mm -hmm. read this. This is just from Wikipedia. But in 1980, Bianchi began a relationship with Veronica Compton, yep. a woman he had met while in prison. During his trial, she testified for the defense, telling the jury a false, a vague tale about the crimes in an attempt to exculpate Bianchi. She also admitted to wanting to buy a mortuary with another convicted murderer for the purpose of necrophilia. <sighs> like, what the fuck? She was later convicted and imprisoned for attempting to strangle a woman she had lured to a motel in an attempt to convince authorities that the hillside strangler was still on the loose. Mm -hmm. Bianchi allegedly had given her some semen during a prison visit to plant on the planned victim to make it look like rape slash murder committed by the strangler. What Fun the fact, fuck? the motel was actually one of the motels that they just demolished over on Samish Way. Was it really? Yeah, they showed pictures oh, of it in the documentary. I just saw that because I was driving down Samish. Yeah. And it was like that weekly hotel or whatever. Right. The one that's like over on the side. Yeah. The is on. I was like, oh, damn, look at all this construction. That was the hotel? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. I recognize the outer buildings. They called it something else back then. But yeah, that's the same hotel. Kenneth Alessio Bianchi, Bianchi is an American serial killer. He and his cousin, Angelo Bueno Jr., together are known as the Hillside Stranglers. He is serving a term of life imprisonment in Washington. Um, he is also a suspect in the Alphabet Murders, three unsolved murders in his home city of Rochester. I was trying to find the part. Maybe I didn't print it out. I talked about him being a pimp. Oh, yeah. So, but, um, Do you have that? A, yeah. They came up with a scheme to make money, him and his cousin. And uh -huh. the idea was to pimp out teenage runaways. Yeah. Their first two victims, Sabrina Hannon and Becky Spears, would both eventually escape. Um, they were desperate to keep the scheme going. So they paid a sex worker to give them a list of their clients. Oh, wow. And uh -huh. 
um, the sex worker, her name was Deborah Noble, and she brought along another sex worker with her when she was handing over the list. It was actually a fake list. Mm -hmm. And the woman that she brought along was named uh, Yolanda Washington. So they found out about the list being a fake, and then they hunted down Yolanda. And this is where they started impersonating cops. This was the first instance of them dressing up and pretending to be cops. They arrested her. They, well, arrested, more like kidnapped, assaulted her, and then they killed her. Um, She was found strangled and left on a hillside near a wooded area. And this became their routine. Um, Hence the name Hillside Strangler. They would strangle the women after impersonating cops yeah. and then dump them on a hillside. And they would take them back. They'd torture them. They'd tie them up. Um, they'd torture them with electric shock, carbon monoxide poisoning, and they'd rape them. They got progressively them. more violent with each. Yeah, victim. sodomized them. Um, anywhere from like 12 years old up until what I'm looking at here, 28 years old. So there's a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 17-year-old. All raped, murdered, tortured. I mean, crazy. There was um, a task force that was formed. It was called the Hillside Strangler Task Force. Mm -hmm. And it was 30 officers from LAPD, um, Glendale Police Department, and the LA Sheriff's Department. And they started putting two and two together once they realized that one of the victims, Cindy Hoodspet, and another victim, Christina Weckler, lived across the street from each other. They didn't know each other, but it was enough of a connection for them to um, start to kind of wonder if these were all connected. And right after that, the killing suddenly stopped Mm -hmm. because that was around the time when Angelo and Kenneth decided that they weren't friends anymore because Angelo was mad about the ride-alongs that Kenneth was doing. He was literally communicating with LAPD about the case that he was involved in. That's crazy. And they were treating him like he was Uh one of them. That's so crazy. That's like... um... You know, the serial killers that return to the crime scene are like, they want to know. They're enjoying yeah. reliving it. Well, Christina Weckler, this is one of the descriptions. She was found naked on a hillside by hikers. Ligature marks were visible on her wrists, ankles, and neck. Her breasts were bruised and blood oozed from her rectum. There were two puncture marks on her arm where she had been injected with Windex, mm. which is random and weird. I, I, don't, know. Cruel, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what what's, that, what's going on with that. But yeah. So there is one more serial killer in um, the Bellingham area that did not visit the Waterfront Tavern as far as we know. It's called James Allen Kinney. So this is one of his victims. So he killed at least three people. Um, The day of the murders were between 1997 and 1998. This guy was a Vietnam War veteran with a history of mental illness. So one of his victims, Carrie Lynn Sherlock, 20, of Braintree, Massachusetts, was eager to see the world. She was already, she was always friendly and trusting of people. These qualities concerned her mother as Sherlock boarded a bus to travel across the country to Bellingham. She let her daughter go, but made Sherlock promise to call every day. Regrettably, her mother would later learn the validity of her concerns as Sherlock became the latest victim of another Bellingham killer. Sherlock came to Bellingham in 1998 to visit her uncle, to look at Western as a potential school, and to see the Pacific Ocean for the first time. As a lover of the outdoors, she went for a hike in the area on October 3rd. This was the last time her uncle and everyone else would see her alive. Her body was later found about an hour outside of Bellingham on the Mount Baker Highway. She was raped and beaten to death. A backpack found near her body led police to James Allen Kinney, a Bellingham resident and Vietnam War veteran with a history of mental illness. A warrant was released for his arrest, but Kinney already fled the area. Kinney also had warrants in Michigan and Ohio for murdering two other women. Kinney managed to avoid capture for three years. It wasn't until a tip was called into America's Most Wanted from a viewer in North Carolina who recognized Kinney that he was arrested and admitted to Sherlock's murder. Kinney was sentenced to life in jail without parole. He's serving his sentence at the Washington State Penitentiary. Penitentiary. (laughs) Do you have anything on him? Yeah, so uh, one of the quotes from one of the regulars... Actually, um, an employee at the Waterfront Tavern had always made a comment about him. He was Uh a regular, and she said he always would have a pint of Budweiser and a bowl of clam chowder. Mm -hmm. He wasn't sociable at all. Yeah. (laughs) It's kind of a common theme. Be on the lookout when you're out at the bars, guys, for the random creepo in the corner. The one who's kind of antisocial. Seems like a common theme is they drink Budweiser. (laughs) Maybe maybe that's the cause of it. (laughs) Um, Kind of an interesting note that was Mm -hmm. also amongst all these quotes um 
former waterfront patrons now incarcerated or dead have been convicted of or are awaiting trial <laughs> for a minimum of 46 <laughs> murders. Oh, my God. And there's been talk about renaming the bar. Uh -huh. The owner is not thrilled with that idea. Uh -huh. They don't really like the association. Uh -huh. But yeah. <laughs> I've, have you been there yeah oh definitely i think i i think i was there once years ago i can't remember though their seafood is really good oh really it's the like, clam chowder <laughs> yeah well they have like deep fried oysters uh -huh. and fish and chips uh -huh. and they have a little walk-up window we actually frequent there pretty often so maybe oh, dustin damn. or i is there killer. something going on <laughs> with you guys <laughs> i know it was kind of creepy to learn about this actually after the fact because uh -huh. i was like wait the waterfront tavern God. i definitely go there a few times i wonder how many people i've talk to outside that yeah. would have been killers i kind of <laughs> want to read ann rule's book the strange oh, yeah. is called the stranger beside me i think yeah yeah god that would be interesting she's definitely a good author and i think she's local too from but that's the Washington. thing is like with serial killers it's like one of the things that i always say that fascinates me is how because who was that guy that they caught like a year or two ago who was a former police officer that would break into homes. Oh. He would rape the wife and the husband or boyfriend would be in the other room. They put like dishes on his back right. and said, if you move, if these make any noise, I'm going to come back and kill, kill you. you. Yep. Who was that? You remember? I don't. They finally caught him through like, you know, a 23 and me or ancestry thing. But he was a former police officer that raped and murdered a bunch of people. I think it was in California. Was it the Golden State Killer? That's probably it. Yeah. Yeah. So his name, what was his name? But it's always interesting where like they kill for like a decade and then they stop and don't kill again for 20 or 30 years and then they're caught all of a sudden. Joseph James D'Angelo. Yeah. Golden State Killer. And he was caught through 23 Me DNA. Yeah. So that's why I was surprised to hear that there's still so many unsolved mm -hmm. cases of murder that can happen because we have all of these <laughs> that, new technologies yeah. and everyone's, you know, getting into submitting their own samples of DNA. So if you submitted DNA... Uh -huh your own i did 23 and me so if you I'm have on any record, family man. members that have committed crimes yeah. they're gonna find them <laughs> that's nuts right yeah but it's always interesting to me the compulsion to like murder that these guys have and then to stop and they, right. they wind up having families and kids pretty normal lives, yeah seemingly. and it's just like it's weird it's almost like like the ted bundy thing with ann rule it's almost like they were like friends they work together and like no red flags or nothing no com completely the opposite he's uh, warning yeah. her to be careful and to lock her cars at night based yeah. on what he's doing to other women and it's just like a hobby of his like people have hobbies on the side <laughs> to paint or do whatever it's just like yeah let's go murder like so weird man it's hard to even imagine what that's like it's crazy yeah, it's probably good that we can't imagine because otherwise you have to wonder. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, uh, that's our murder podcast. We're going to do more of these. Um, it's nice to be back and do these pods again. Yeah. It's been like about a year or so. so. A little bit of hometown love with something Yeah, we just wanted in. to welcome you guys to Bellingham for those of you that knew the area with uh, the Walk serial killer doors. stories. So, yeah. That's what we're all about. Yep. And uh, go visit the Waterfront Tavern. Oh, definitely. And, the uh, food is so good. Yeah, so we'll be busting out some more pods. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Till next time. Awesome, guys. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.